And this podcast is presented to you by Kia, official vehicle of the Orlando Magic. And boy, are we excited to catch up with our guest, Anthony Johnson, kind enough to join us. 13 NBA seasons, but of course, two big ones here in Central Florida. And I think, first of all, AJ, it's great to see you, but we got to know how that golf game is. Are you getting any time to play golf these days? Yeah, uh, here in Atlanta, the weather's pretty decent, so I'm getting uh, to low 80s. And, you know, every now and again, I sneak around in 79, but, uh, you know, I just have too many. I have too many triples to really get it low, but. How many, uh, foot, wed- how many foot wedges on that 79? <laughs> no, no, no I play by the rules. Hey, man, I'm a man of integrity. I play by the rules, man. That's I'm true, not, I'm true. not, uh, what's the guy name? Uh, Patrick Reed. I'm not Patrick reading my <laughs> no. way to low scores. You know, I, I, uh, I follow the rules of, of golf. Yeah, no, AJ, Dante, you guys Dante are you guys are so wedges and we're in the I know, you guys are so <laughs> you guys are so frustrating. He could play an NBA career, he played football in high school, and now he can golf in the high 70s. Man, that's maddening. That's maddening for hey, someone like hey, me. Hey, God bless some people with talent and uh <laughs> I guess and then, I and guess, then there's us. I, guess I, then I there's found us. the right line that day. I <laughs> found the right line. And he let no. and he let some and he let us meet some of those people. Yeah, right, exactly. That's, exactly right. That's what we exactly. got to do, George. Well, well AJ, I, got, let us know. I got beef though. I got beef, Dante. Okay. How okay. do you have a Tom Brady, a big poppy, and a T Mac jersey? And no AJ, no come on, man. What's oh, up with that, man? man? Come on. That's a very good point. That's a, give it to him, AJ. I I'm thought I was your this. favorite. I thought no, I was there's the, no there's no question. That's why we're just going to bring this out into the garage and I'm going to show you my AJ display. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He calls it AJ. He calls it AJ Corner. It's right next to the beer fridge. Wow. It's AJ Corner. Wow. Right next to the it's beer probably fridge. next to a recycling bin. The <laughs> Let me tell you bin. something. Next time, <laughs> next time you see me, that will be up there. I will okay. take that. I, I got to have that up there because I want him to get his seventh ring. Yeah. But then after that, I'll, I'll take that down. Okay. Oh, all right. All good. Okay. All let's, good. let's, can we ask AJ about how we feel yeah. about this situation? Okay. AJ. So, you know, Dante's a big Patriots guy is a big Boston, um, right? Tom Brady, but now suddenly he's rooting for the bucks. How do we feel about that? Being an athlete, being a sports guy, in. how do we, how do we feel about that? AJ? I think, I think we have to recognize greatness. And, you know, with, with Tom Brady, uh, I, you know, I, I was a big fan of the Patriots with, with Belichick and Brady together, their marriage. But, you know, uh, they got a divorce. And now you see one is having success with the other. Uh, I'm not quite sure if the Patriots organization will get back until they find that uh, elite quarterback. And yeah. they're probably a few years away. But Tom Brady, to see him at 43, go after it and have it with, you know, within his grasp. Okay, uh, but, that's not the, but that's not the question. The question <laughs> is, the question is, as a fan. That, I, I will say, in? I will say Boston guys, Boston fans, you know, they are diehard. So yes. I will probably have to, I will probably have to deduct some points from Dante because Boston, you, they don't support other teams outside of Boston. And that's the that one guy. exception. That's the only exception I made. That's, that's the, the only exception. exception. That's the only right. exception okay. I made. Because right. I think we did him wrong. I think he should still be in New England. And I yeah, think yeah, yeah, him. yeah. That's all. So that's why. So I, I side right. my allegiance with him. What do you think about a 43-year-old playing at the top of his game like that? How much does that impress you, AJ? It's definitely impressive. Uh, but, you know, for Tom Brady, it's always been between the ears. Uh, you know, he wasn't the most athletic. He didn't have the strongest arm. But between the ears, he was just a step ahead of everyone else. And now that he's able to, you know, he's up there in age, now he's able to coach the guys through what he sees and what he wants them to do. And whenever you have a coach uh, that can play at a high level, I mean, it's just, you know, you're going to have great success. So, you know, I I love the quarterback position. And Tom Brady is one of my favorites uh, as a quarterback. And you have to acknowledge uh, his greatness and what he's able to accomplish. I love this. See, this is why AJ is my favorite. He's exactly right. <laughs> this is why AJ's got- shrine is out by my recycling bin. <laughs> exactly right. This is exactly right. This now, is so, the- so tell me, George, what, uh, who, why, what do you have against uh, Tom Brady? And no, it's not. I have nothing against Tom Brady. Right. Okay. Not, it, I have. I have something against Dante. Okay. Who okay. Is a, right. Who is a right. diehard? Well, 
quote unquote die hard okay, Patriots okay. fan. And all, right. all of a sudden, when one guy leaves, he switches then, his allegiance to the to the team that he went on. Like I said, if I I'm a big Mets fan, Daryl Strawberry, when Daryl Strawberry went to the Dodgers, I didn't start cheering for the Dodgers. The Dodgers. Okay. All right. You know, all right. That, I'm rolling with you. Doesn't to me it doesn't work that way. But he he claims that he still was rooting for the Patriots, but but rooting for Tampa Bay on the side. But now he's got pictures on his social media, with Tampa Bay <laughs> shirts, him and his pops up there, like swashbuckling hats. Okay, man. okay, all right. Uh, right. Okay, Let me all ask right. you this. Let me ask you this. I feel like the line did, is crossed. I feel okay, like did okay, Strawberry, okay. Did Daryl Strawberry win you six championships? No, but and he won me they, one. Yes, he did. I, yes, he, I don't, did. he doesn't need to win me six. Like that. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Okay. Like, Eli right. Manning won me too. And if Eli Manning yeah. went to the Raiders, I wouldn't start rooting rooting for the Raiders. I just I just don't well, think- AJ, let me ask, let me ask you this. As someone that understands football, because George and I got cut during tryouts. So, <laughs> uh, George, someone that George's mom wouldn't let him play. <laughs> <laughs> but you won a you won a high school championship playing football. Remind everybody about your your football career. Uh you know, it was my senior year. It was like a perfect storm. You know, like in South Carolina, they take football very seriously. But back in those days, like I played every sport. So whatever season it was, that's the sport I was playing. And even with basketball, I never really got time to go to summer camps or to give any extra attention to basketball. I just, football season, I played football. Basketball, I played basketball. And baseball, I played baseball. By my senior year, it was one of those things. It was a perfect storm. We played good ball. And we were able to uh, to make it happen. And I missed like the first six or seven basketball games of my senior year. So, uh, but uh, I wouldn't trade that in for the world. So yeah, we had a good time. And you know, football is a team. It's the ultimate team sport. And right. the reason why I love it is it's a man sport. Like you can't get hit and cry. You can't flop your way or snap your neck to success. Like you got to <laughs> dig in and you know, you got to take hits. You got to take it under the chin. You got to take it in the chest and you got to get back up the next play and do it all again. So uh, I was a big football fan and doing the, doing that playoff run. Uh, we played some good teams. I got knocked on my butt a lot of times. And uh, it's what did just you play, AJ? Those... Were you were you defense? Were you offense? Oh, man, man, come on. What kind of question is that? Doc? Come on. What kind of question is that? You talking to the man right here? I, of course, I'm a the quarterback. Football? And you were throwing the football. I didn't yeah, I'm a that. quarterback, and you know I can't take orders from anyone. You know, <laughs> like, 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 you know, I'm not, yes, I'm no, not no. in a huddle taking orders from anyone else. So yeah, I'm, I'm a quarterback. I'm a quarterback, point guard, and a shortstop. I'm the one always Amazing. calling, calling uh the commands and the plays and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't take orders very well. So AJ, this is, this, is, this is a good segue because I actually was having this conversation with, with a friend of mine a couple of days ago about kids and play, just playing one sport. And, and I grew up in the time, I mean, we're almost the same age and you're clearly a better athlete than I am. But like, <laughs> just like you said, when it was when it was baseball season, we played baseball. When it was basketball season, yep. we played basketball. When it, and you just don't see that anymore. And what, what are your thoughts on that? Because it, it's 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 misguided. In my opinion, it's misguided for the kids. I just want to get your opinion on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, I make my son, uh, he, he doesn't play football anymore, but he played football for a few years, basketball, baseball, soccer. And now we, we transitioned to uh, flag football, but I made him try everything. I don't believe in pigeonholing yourself to one sport because you, you, probably burn out a lot quicker than other people. You plateau a lot quicker than other people. And you just, the love uh, gets lost sometimes. And so I'm not a fan of kids that just train all year long in one sport, play that one sport. And it's just, it's just overkill to me. So uh, I, I tend to favor on the side of playing multiple sports. And, you know, more times than not, you have, when you play baseball, you play on a team, you have a different crowd in baseball that you need to adapt to. And it's just, uh, you know, it helps you as far as just learning relationships, just being social. Sure. And, you know, you just play with different football guys. They're a little different. You know, they're hard heads and, you <laughs> yeah. know, they're, they're tough. Then basketball guys, a little bit more on the finesse side than baseball guys, you know, are dirty. And, you know, so you have a different crowd with each team. And you learn how to interact with those kids and parents. And so I'm a fan of, you know, not only for sports and athletic reasons, but for social reasons as well. 
But also like AJ, the bottom line is, is if you're good enough at basketball, whatever it is, basketball, baseball, football, like if you're good enough, the coach will put you on the team at some point when your other season is over and someone yeah. at a higher level will find you if you're good enough. And that's the bottom line. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, training since you were a fetus in the baseball lab, <laughs> just take, you know what I mean? Like it's, I just see yeah. these kids and it's, it's a little frustrating sometimes. Yes. Yeah. But you know, sometimes uh, in my, like now being around youth sports, you have a lot of coaches that say, well, if you're not available from day one, then you're not going to make the team. And that's unfair. And you, you know, you yeah. kind of limit the talent pool that you have access to. But a lot of youth coaches, a lot of high school coaches, they are on some, if you're not training every day, then you're not doing, you're not giving us your best. And yeah. it's just unfair. And I'm glad I didn't have that mm -hmm. situation to deal with. But I also had a dad that was 6'4", 250 pounds, and no <laughs> one was going to tell him uh, AJ cannot play <laughs> one sport or another. So, you All know, right. well, uh, that, yeah, that no one be, wanted to deal with yeah. Daddy Johnson. But that uh, may be where my kids are at a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, but, but it's, it's unfair. That, it's yeah, unfair. It's that. unfair. How is, uh, how is AJ the coach? You, you're coaching your kids. How do you, Are you into it? Are you vocal? Are you quiet? What you uh, I am into it, like, on weekend tournaments. By Sunday night, uh, I have to get some warm water and salt and uh -oh. gargle my throat because nice. I'm yelling. But I, I don't yell. I'm, I'm more yelling plays, yelling commands, you know, look ahead, swing the ball, you know, more uh, things to help them understand the game a little bit better. But I try to do most of my work in practice. I, my teams are prepared, so practice is, is more of my focus. And when we get to the games, it's more of just trying to recreate what we do in practice. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you just, you, I just want to help my kids out. So I'm yelling more commands than, than the bad yelling that we all know coaches can do. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I got like, so I, you know, working with the Magic and being around basketball doesn't mean I know it, but uh, I could say one thing to my daughters, but if they hear it from someone else, it's law. Oh, right? yeah. Is, that the, is, is it the same with you? Like your son's pretty good, right? Your son's playing AAU. Is, is it the same thing? How's that dynamic? Uh, I, I think we have a little fear in there. So he knows okay, when I give him a certain look, that means tighten up and, you know, do what daddy is ask, or do what coach is asking. But once we get in the car, then I transition to daddy. But but for the most part, hey, man, tighten up and do what I tell you. You know that I have your best interests in hand. You know, I'm not going to tell you anything that's that's not correct. But uh, he he's he's a pretty good kid. So for the most part, he listens. But, you know, every now and again, he ventures out on his own. And sometimes I just have to let him experience yeah. whatever it is. Maybe he wants to fail. Maybe he thought about a move and he wants to try it. I have to let him experience that so he could pass or fail. And then we'll talk about it and we can either keep it or we could throw it away. So, you know, at uh, whatever I see, I know is for his betterment. But sometimes he has to experience certain things. Uh, on his own. So I try to give him that leeway is a lot better when we have a 30 or 40 point game. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot. You could try whatever you want, but you know, when it's a close game, I need you to keep it close to the best, but you know, we have a good relationship. He loved, I always ask him year in and year out, Hey, do you want me to coach your team? Do you want me to coach your school team? Do you want me to coach your AU team? And he, without a doubt, yeah, yes, I want you to coach my team. Awesome. So That's he cool. loves it, and I'm cool with it. Long as long as we had that solid relationship and it doesn't get fractured, I'm cool with whatever he wants to do. Did you God, get, I did wish you could coach our lot? team. Yeah, I wish no, you could no, coach no. our. <laughs> we got our, gir our girls are six and seven. We could use some coaching. We could. Use oh, some. that's because that's because Dante's coaching them. Like, <laughs> exactly. Running around playing with their pigtails over there. That's, that's what's going on at the, that. Yeah, so, did, AJ, did you get any advice before you started coaching your son? Did you get any advice from other people on how to handle it and how to handle coaching uh, your own kid as opposed to other kids? Or did yeah, you just, I mean, you just jump right you know, into it? Yeah, uh, well, the biggest piece of advice was from John Lucas, the coach at Houston Rockets. You know, he's like, if you have time to coach your kid, you need to do it. You don't want the UPS man. You don't want the garbage man. You don't want someone that PR does guy. basketball coaching your son when you physically are capable of doing it. So that was the biggest piece of advice, you know, from John Lucas. If I'm physically able and can fit it in to go do it. So 
but when you watch sports, you watch a lot of coaches, you see a lot of youth coaches doing things the wrong way. You see a lot of daddy ball where a guy has a son on a team and he basically just fills out the team to cater to his son. You know, those kind of things, yeah. you know, that that's not cool. So, you know, for the most part, I avoid and I avoid those type of situations. And I just kind of you got to just always take uh, the temperature of the climate around you. So when you watch youth sports, you know what's going on. And yeah, I try to go the opposite of all the bad coaching in youth sports. You know, one last thing on this, AJ, and then I want to get into some more stuff, too. But, um, it, you know, they always joke at the end of an NBA game, it's almost hard to know who won now. Because of all the hugging and handshakes and and all that stuff, does that is that a byproduct of AAU and these guys knowing each other and, and establishing lifelong friendships? And what do you make of of all that? Should there should there be a little more adversary relationships, or is that kind of where we're at now? I think it's it's a big part of it because when you play AAU, you play a lot of teams. The good teams you you run into more often than not, and some of the kids know each other, uh, especially here in Atlanta. You know, we play a lot of rival teams and the kids know each other through social media or just, you know, in sports in general. So they grow up playing against each other. And uh, I think at the end of games, you see a lot of the NBA guys, you know, they go to McDonald's, they go to the NBA top 100 camp, yeah. then, you know, in college. So, yeah, I mean, they, they built relationships. But at the end of the day, man, you got to compete. And that's one thing that, I think the game has gotten away from a lot of people always talking about tempo, tempo, tempo. And the other night I watched the Nets and the Wizards. How do you give up 146 points in a regulation game and lose? <laughs> and yeah, it, it, was, it was just tough to watch. But everybody's talking about tempo and giving up and scoring. And But at the end of the day, I got to look my guy in the, in the eyes and stop him. I, I got to stop him. Like I'm not sitting anywhere allowing somebody to score 30 and 40 and 45 and 50 points and it's cool with me and he leaves the court without a busted lip or a busted eye or something something has to happen for me but that's old school and the game has changed a little bit but I just I'm just not cool with any team scoring more than 115 points in today's climate and yeah, and there's no furniture moving in the locker room. Or, I don't see. Uh, we're not having a discussion. Right. Yes, I don't see Anthony Johnson giving up 47 and then walking off the court with a jersey swap. After I, that. I yeah, exactly. I a jersey. I mean, a jersey swap, a, a hand dap. Like, I mean, I just we. I, I text you after the game. We can. I'll catch up can, with you later. But, but we're right. not. We're, I'm not. I I just took it upon myself to always be one of the leaders. Sure. And if you. Are leading like if you f felt like someone scoring 47 was cool and you're dapping a guy up and in jersey swap, what is that telling my teammates? That's telling my teammates that I'm okay with it. And you yeah, know, good point. you're not going to be successful like that. And I, and you know, and just as an individual, I wouldn't be okay with that. And like I said, yeah, my opponent, if he's ever having now, not to say I didn't get my little butt handed to me every now and again, sure, but, sure, but. I would probably say, yeah, if someone's having a good game, something has to happen to him. He's going to – it's going to be a blood stoppage somewhere, <laughs> somehow, some way. God, I miss gonna, AJ. God, I miss AJ. We need Man. AJ back now. you, you got to be able to give us like three minutes. Can you give us three minutes? <laughs> Hey, hey, Six anybody that's cutting minutes. the check, I can find three minutes for you. All you got to do is cut the check. <laughs> that's exactly right. We're going to get working All on All of that. a sudden, AJ's in the back doing this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. You. AJ, 13, you. You, 13 NBA seasons, right? You got three trips to the NBA finals with a couple of different teams. You went twice with New Jersey and, and once here in Orlando, which we yeah. all remember. Um, multiple co Eastern Conference finals appearances as well. What, what are you most proud of when you think back on – 13 years, all the lifelong relationships you met, but you were on some very good teams as well. You were part of, you were part of a lot of success. Yeah. Uh, the one thing for me as an individual, you know, there's only 400 players in the NBA. So to be one of 400 for 13 years, you know, that says a lot. Then as you play, you break down a rotation. If you're in the top 10, then that's 200. If you're starting or playing heavy minutes, then you're 100, 150. So I used to pride myself on being one of the top, 200 players in the world and uh, to do it for 13 years, 
coming out of Charleston, South Carolina, the NBA, you know, I didn't have any type of examples, you know, growing up. I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't go to any NBA games because we didn't have, you know, we had the Hawks, but, you know, my family couldn't right. afford going to uh, an NBA game. But, yeah, it's just coming out of nowhere, uh, having some success in college and then getting drafted and being able to, you know, reinvent myself every two or three years to have a 13-year career. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that. But the big man upstairs blessed me to have that success. And, you know, I'm just uh, happy to, you know, take care of my family and kind of now, you know, relax and just enjoy, uh, you know, raising my kids and, and having a good life. So, yeah, I was just blessed and really pride in myself on being one of the top 400, 300, 200 players in the world. But AJ, your path wasn't easy either. I mean, let's let's look back at your path. You were the first player to ever get drafted out of the Char uh, College of Charleston. Yep. And you're a second round pick, so there's nothing guaranteed. Uh, and then you were in the league for a few years, and then and then you dipped down into the into the D League. Your journey as a as a whole did that did that help you just keep grinding, just become the player that you were? I mean, you were always just such a hard working guy, uh, every minute on the floor. Yeah, I mean. You have to give the team and give the NBA something to keep you around. And, you know, I was a big point guard. You know, defense was my thing. Uh, I came into the NBA not being a great shooter, but I was athletic and I could make plays. But every, you know, two or three years, I got better as a shooter, uh, adding, then adding the three ball, then adding corner threes. But uh, early on in my career, you know, I – kind of fell in love with the lifestyle a little bit too much and wasn't as focused as I needed to be. And when you're not focused and you're not playing with confidence, you're going to find your way out of the league quick, fast. So I had to bounce down to the D league, get my focus and uh, turn my attention back to why I'm here. And, you know, this, there's no other lifestyle that you could really, you know, go to and transition to that's going to pay you millions of dollars. So let me get my mind right and get back to doing what I needed to do and was able to, you know, prolong my career another eight, seven, eight, nine years. But, uh, yeah, it's just for me, the, the best thing that I kind of figured out was just kind of reinventing myself. You know, every year, every two years, coming back with something different, something new. And then when you got those, for me, when I got those opportunities to start or the starters hurt to play like two weeks, take advantage of those two weeks by averaging 15 points and seven assists, you know, having decent numbers. So I can either be a starter or a backup. So, uh, yeah, I, I just really prided myself on working hard and being prepared. And when my name was on the marquee to step up and play well and, and lead my team to wins. How long AJ though, did that take you to realize that that's what you had to do to, to have that long of a career? Because like you said, you, you fell in love with the lifestyle early on and then was, was the, was the bump down to the D-League, like, was that your wake-up call? Or what, well, how long does that take for you to figure out I what to do? I think reality is when you're not getting a check on the 1st and 15th, yeah. and mom and dad, like, you told them to retire and not do much of anything, right. uh, reality hits you that, hey, man, you know, I got I to take care of business. I got to handle business. And, you know, for the most part, like, the, there's a movie, I think I love my wife with Chris Rock, like, the lifestyle. You'll never lose the lifestyle chasing money, but chasing money, you can lose the lifestyle. So, you know, it's just one of those things that, yeah, I fell in love with the lifestyle a little bit too much and I needed to get focused on, you know, what was best for me and my family. And that was playing good ball and being the best player I could be. We certainly did that. What, what a great, what, what a great uh, insight for future players and, and future athletes. What, when the opportunity came to come to Orlando, AJ, just what kind of, discussions did you have with your agent or with Stan or Otis? How, how did the whole marriage with you and Orlando come in 2008? I think before uh, I was a, I was a free agent. And the, the one good thing about being a free agent for me, Anthony Johnson was good teams wanted a solid backup point guard. Yeah. So the, the good thing for me, I didn't really have to deal with the teams that wasn't winning or rebuilding you know, I, I could really focus, my agent and I could really focus on the 16 teams that made the playoffs. And, okay. you know, of course, the teams that make it to the conference championships and the finals, you know, they're probably going to be pretty solid and set and they're not going to really make any changes. But the teams that get put out in the first round or the second round, 
they need that little bump to get them, you know, headed in the right direction. And when I watched you guys, I believe that year uh, you lost to Detroit, but I'm not right. sure. Yeah, but I, I saw Jameer, I saw the white, uh, Big Turk and Richard, man. And I was like, this is a team that could use uh, what I bring to the table. And, you know, they were uh, probably, for me, the team that I zeroed in on in free agency and told my agent, let's try to figure out a way to get here. And Otis and Stan made it happen. So uh, I was blessed. And like I said, and when I when I signed and got there, we played, you know, Stan used to bring us in uh, for weeks at a time early on to kind of get a head start. Man, right off the bat, the first two days, I was like, we could win a championship here. And, really? you know, having been in the finals, like we, you know, you got the dominant big man, you got rebounding, and our shooting was unbelievable. But we had good size. That, and that, you know, with Big Turk at 6'11", and Rashard at 6'10", and those two guys running pick and rolls and able to execute it like, like guards, like, yeah, I, I, I knew that we would have a shot if we could stay healthy. And luckily, everything worked out for us and we were able to have great success. But our size and our shooting was one of those things that we could hang our hat on and it, yeah, it led us to great success. It's funny you said that because I feel like I, we know from outsiders being around the team and we, we can watch a practice or two, like right in, at training camp or before training camp. And you can you can get it a feel right away, like, man, we are, we are going to struggle this year. Like it's going to be, it's going to be, <laughs> we're looking at 33 wins at the most, like this is going to be rough or it can go the other way where you're looking at yeah. a team and you just go, damn, we have a shot. Like we, and there's not too many teams out there that can really look at their team and go, we have a shot. And you knew that right away, right? Like that was yeah, something. I mean, and you, of course you just, you always started with the starters. You know, we had Jameer, Big Turk, uh, Richard and Dwight, but even, Marsh, you knew Marsh was going to step in and play well when, I mean, he had developed, right. they had developed right. him. And we, now you could tell he was coming into his own that we could count on him. You had JJ who was young and playing good ball. Courtney Lee playing good ball, who was a rookie, but he was very mature after playing four years in college. He came in as a mature rookie, which a lot of teams, you know, don't get nowadays because everyone wants to come out and right. one wants to be one and done. But, you know, to have a four-year uh, college player ready to step in and play well. And then you had MP, Tony Batti, Like, everybody down the line was going to get an opportunity and they were going to take advantage of the opportunity. So, you know, with the player development that Stan had in place, I knew that we were going to, you know, be able to get it done. Now, one thing I remember about that season before the year, we and uh, you were obviously there because you're on the team. We had a we had a, a dinner right before camp started. I don't know if you remember this, and I was lucky enough to be in the room. And Stan went around, and Otis went around to each of you, all 15 guys, basically laying out what. And this was in front of the whole group, laying out what your role was. This is what your role on the team from from Dwight all the way down to, to the, you know, to the 15th guy and, and everybody was important and this was your role and this is what you're going to do to get us there. And I, I found that interesting because there's, I, there's, there's been other teams where we've been around that is not, that's not the case. And that's part of the reason why things fall apart. You knew right away, even then, right? Like yeah. that meeting because everybody was fine with what their role was for the most part. Yes. And that was the great thing about Otis and Stan, their communication, like, you know, it wasn't any gray area whether it was game plan, whether it was your role, there was no gray area. So you knew what you were getting into. You knew what was expected of you at all times. And then it was on you to go out and do it. And, you know, for the most part, when you have teams that are buying for a championship, everybody's going to put their, for the most part, they're going to put their best foot forward and do what they need to do. And we had a great collection of guys led by Otis and Stan and the DeVos family that was going to go out and get it done. And we were blessed to stay healthy. Uh, the whole time. But uh, yeah, I mean, their communication early on and throughout the season and throughout the whole run was very important for us achieving success. You know, AJ, I remember that. Feel and then you guys have the great start. And then you have three all-stars. You could argue, you know, Turkaloo should have been an all-star that year as well. And then the injury to Jameer. And we all remember kind of how much that hurt because it was playing the best basketball of his career. You're able to find Rafer. And then you guys can, and we've talked about this a couple of times before, but you guys just caught lightning in a bottle. And I don't know if 
I don't know if I've heard from you really how that worked. Like, how did your mentality change to now I got, I got, this is, I'm a primary focus on this team. I'm going to come in and play big minutes. How did you work that out with Rafer? How, how were you guys such a great one, two compliment? And that, that was a special thing about our team. Uh, Rafer, Jameer and I, we were in constant conversation about the role of the team, our individual roles, how things are going to play out. And early in the season, Jameer was hot scorching. And, yeah. you know, and I, and to go back in Philly, we had a, a team bonding unit, a, a moment or event in Philly with that Jameer orchestrated. And Jameer and I, I conversed with him like, Jameer, this is your team. I'm just here to play 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to play the best that I can do, but you do your thing. I mean, there is no competition. I'm not trying to start. I'm 34, 35 at the time. This is your team. This team is going to go as far as you take it. And I think in the past, there may have been some, you know, they had Carlos Arroyo, Keon Dooling, Jameer. Right. So, you know, they had a revolving door at the point guard spot. But I assured him, and not that he needed my assurance, but, you know, just conversating as teammates that are conversing as teammates that this is your team. You're going to start. You do what you do. I'm going to come in and I'm going to do what I do. And let's lead this team. And uh, I think that kind of allowed him to just relax and just play ball. And he had a great season. And unfortunately, you know, he went down with the injury. And, uh, you know, I was up in age. So playing 35 plus minutes every night was going to be a challenge. And with the playoffs on the horizon, they made a move to get skipped. And, you know, he came in playing good ball. You know, we would all talk about, yeah, just playing, just doing what the team needed. You know, of course, we were going to play through Dwight and Richard. So all we have to do is just be solid. We don't have to be great. Just be solid. And it worked out and we had some success. You know, my favorite, my favorite part after that run, uh, when we, you know, when we went through Boston and then we, we beat Cleveland in the end. And, and nobody talks about this, Dante. And it's something that I noticed right away. And nobody, I don't know if anybody's ever know, uh, talked about it. If you remember Cleveland, they, you know, they won 60 something games that year, right? AJ, they, they yes. were the clear. Everybody thought for sure. Cleveland was going to just steamroll right through everybody. And before the game, they're always, they're doing this little thing with the, <laughs> with the, with the high fives and, and Mo, and they would always pretend to take a picture. Like they take a picture and they're all standing there like this and doing this. And Mo Williams, I think jumped into somebody's arms a couple of times. Like that was his thing. And I remember we won the, the East and we're all waiting, but you know, to get the trophy. And I look over, and AJ has jumped up into into Skip. Skip was the one holding you, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and what? A, you can go back and look at all the pictures. We have they're all over the place. And there's AJ. He's almost <laughs> he's almost laying down in Skip's arms, giving you one of these. That's awesome. I knew what he was doing. Nobody yeah. talks about that. Was my favorite part of the whole thing. Yeah. I was like, I was like, yes, AJ. That that's what I wanted to see. That was great. Yeah, that season, you know, of course they expected the Lakers to come out the West and Cleveland to come out the East, and they were the mighty Cleveland Cavaliers, and they won a whole bunch of games, and they were just running roughshod through any through everyone. But you know, they won a lot of home games. Like they like when you watch their team, they were a great home team. They really, of course, you went 66 games. You went some games on the road, but you could tell their armor wasn't as tough when they went on the road. And uh, the little, the little, what you're talking about, like before the games, they would do like a family picture. So they would do their high Every fives, time. and then somebody, uh, LeBron would probably would pretend like he had a camera, and all the guys on their team would line up like they're doing a family shot. And, you know, that was their fun little thing. And, but, we played them late in the season. And when we played them, it, I mean, of course, you know, I, I had been around. I was like, we're going to beat these guys in the playoffs because they, they're a one-man team. Of course, they're great. But if you just slow down Mo Williams, you slow down, uh, I think, Big Z. Like, if you just make them a one-man team, of course, that guy was a great player. If you make them a one-man team, they're going to fold like a bad deck of cards. <laughs> And we were able to do that. And so when we won, it was like, yeah, the mighty. And you could kind of tell 
LeBron made that great shot to win game two. We really should have been up to 2-0 yes. right. leaving right. Cleveland. Right. So with that being said, like once they made that shot and they celebrate like the championship, the series was over. We were going, we were going to smack them down in Orlando and it was just a matter of time. So once we won, it was a great feeling, of course, to, to, to beat the mighty Cavaliers, of course. But yeah, I wanted to poke a little bit of fun. It ain't, it ain't so much fun when the rabbit has the gun. So, you know, they used to make fun of everybody, taking family pictures, all that. Yeah, yeah it, ain't, it ain't so much fun when someone else has the gun was and, the, and, and, and trolling you. Was the pose planned? Did we know oh, that that's what well, we I did? planned it. I mean, I, I was going to do it. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't tell Skip and Jameer until uh, <laughs> until after we won, of course, because you don't want to pre-plan and get into all that kind of stuff. But so in your head, right. that's where you yeah, yeah, going. I was, yeah, were, yes, you I was def- with laying down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Down, yeah. Skip had uh, Jameer had my legs and Skip yes. had my upper body, but yeah, <laughs> I definitely was going to do that. So uh, yeah, that was planned when we when we won the series. That was definitely something that was planned during the celebration. That's my favorite. That's yeah, my that's favorite to this outstanding. Day. You know, I've gotten to know Turk a little bit better too. And obviously we knew him a lot. He moved back to Orlando and I'll see him from time to time, but um, he's still mad that he had the game winner in that game too. Yeah. That, that, right. That was going to be the, that was going to be the, he hit that big shot. Yes. With one second left before the impossible shot. Um, and, he, and he reminds me quite often that he should have had the game winner. <laughs> Give me your best Turk story. Give me your best big memory, Turk. Big best, <laughs> big best best story of TV. There's so many. There are so many stories, but it's just one of those things with Big Turk. His personality is awesome. You can always clown and joke with him, and he's just like, I don't care, man. You know, but he was he was always a good ball player. But the one thing is Turk w- did not really take care of himself the way that he should have. No. So I used to always tease like, so in the finals, he's eating pizza before the game, yes. all, you know, and we are expecting him to play 35, 40 minutes, handle the ball. And I was like, Turk, you're the only person in the NBA finals that played 40 minutes that's out of shape. How is that possible? <laughs> How are you out of shape after playing 120 games 35 minutes a game and you still out of shape. How is that oh. possible? So yeah, <laughs> I, I used to give Turk a big time about his uh, physical shape, uh, you know, when we played together, but he was a good sport, uh, you know, and, and for me, you know, I love to laugh. I love the joke. Sure. If you're not, if we're not, if you, you know, if you're not joking on me and we, we're not having fun, then why are we doing this? So I used to love having fun and Jerk was, uh, Turk was one of the guys that you could joke on a lot. But you know what? There's some guys that can't that can dish it out but can't take it. I think we all know through our NBA travels who some of those teammates might have been. But you could do that. You would Man. give it to guys, but you'd laugh harder than anyone else if hey. you got you right. And I, I, I love the good joke. I, I and I purposely used to do stuff so people could joke on me. I would dress poorly. I would do stuff that. Hold yeah, on, you I dress mean, poorly on purpose. You dress poorly other. on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as there wasn't any females around, right, like, you know, right, right, like right. it's just us and it's just the guys. Right. Yeah, right. there's no females around. Well, yeah, I'm trying to impress, right? right? Yeah, yeah right. exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so yeah, I used to I used to like guys cracking jokes on me. And as long as they weren't personal, like, I, I would laugh right. as hard as I could whenever someone would give me a good joke. But I had no problem being the brunt of jokes. I enjoyed it. And... Yeah, the funnier the better. And so yeah, I, I was open to anyone cracking a joke on me. I love to laugh and I could laugh at myself. I, I don't have any issues with that. I'm confident in with the person I am. You know, I'm mature. So yeah, it was just one of those things that I enjoyed someone cracking a good joke that everybody could laugh and it could lighten the mood and we could have fun. Because like I said, you spend so much time together, yeah. you know, you need to you need to be able to enjoy it and enjoy enjoy the journey. AJ, what do you remember about the, about the finals? I know, you know, for me and George, we understood Jameer come back and we wish there was still, I think you guys all were happy to have Jameer back. I think we still wanted to see you be a part of it as well. And I don't, I don't think we, we understood quite how that worked, but you look at the finals, everything that happened, you guys were, were close. I mean, you get, you get one or two breaks to go another way. I mean, you guys were right there. That was not a 4-1 series. That To me, that was a winnable series for you. Yeah, well, during the season, we smacked them twice. Well, we yes. didn't smack them, but we won both games. 
You know, the game in L.A., Jameer made a big shot to win the game. When they came to Orlando, we smacked them by, right. like, 20. And I didn't feel like they were on our level. Like, you know, and when we were done with the Cleveland series, we were playing the best basketball that we could possibly play. And I just felt like – I felt like if things were normal, that would have been a, a not an easy series because you can't ever count out, you know, Kobe – and, you know, God bless him. But I just felt like that would have been a series that we would probably win in six games if we didn't really make any changes. But, you know, people, yeah, people have decisions to make. And But the one thing I think, you know, besides the coaching staff, I was the only one that made it to the finals as far as a player. Right. So it was good to see those guys experience it. And I couldn't put it into words because playing a finals in, in L.A. is just unbelievable. Like, it's, you know, of course, the Lakers had their mystique and their tradition. But, you know, trying to explain to the guys that you're going to be out in L.A., the weather's going to be nice, but you can't get – you can't lose track. You can't get out there and think, oh, we're in L.A. like the regular season. No, you got 24 is coming at you. Their, their tradition is coming at you. With, before the games, the reporters are going to be on the court. They're not going to allow you to get your normal pregame routine. And it's just, it's just different. It's just different. And I disagreed with, you know, at the time, they brought families out. I disagreed with it because, hey, we need to go out here focused. Like, right. the Mamba is coming. And right. we need to be ready. And not, nothing against families. But, you know, I, I felt like the team that we needed needed to be a little bit more focused. And we needed to kind of hunker down and kind of, you know, get that one through 15 mentality. But with the families there, you know, you're going to play daddy, you're going to play father, sure. you know, you're going family outings are going to be part of this trip. And we need to focus on winning a game out here. And I was overruled. But, uh, you know, it was just one of those things that we needed to win one game out in L.A. And when that didn't happen, you know, trying to win four out of six was going to be a yeah. challenge. But we were playing – going into the series, we were playing the best ball. And, you know, it was just one of those things that I know I felt like my hands was close to being around that trophy, you know, leading up right. to it. And, uh, you know, but uh, it got away from us. And, you know, it was just a great experience. But it was good for – you know, all the other guys that were in the uniforms to experience that. Cause now your training changes in the summertime. Now, you know, okay, this is what it takes to make it to the finals. You got to be sharp and yeah. all that stuff and all that work takes place in the summertime. I remember thinking, okay, now you, I'm got sad, a, Dante. you, you got sad. a young, well, I remember thinking you got a young Dwight. You got a, we're going to, this is probably the first of five trips right, just, right <laughs> and, to the NBA. You're just not, you're not just guaranteed. doesn't work. And guess what, Dante? I felt that. And yeah. trips yeah. to the NBA Finals are not guaranteed. No. And no. they are not anything that you could just take for granted. And that right. was something that I felt similar to what you're saying. Because, you know, with the Celtics, like they went to the Finals, one, Then the next year, KG gets hurt. And right. now, you know, they're just right. an average team then. But, you know, right. when you have that window of opportunity, you got to take advantage of it. You can't play around with it. You can't like, like with Belichick when he didn't play Malcolm Butler. Like what? Like you just right, right, right. You can't like you. You gotta. You gotta. He doesn't care. AJ. He's a he's a Bucks fan now. He doesn't care about that. <laughs> oh, okay. He doesn't care about that. It no, all that serves is not true. <laughs> that drives me crazy. And then to yeah. compound it, you let him have one special teams play just to send a message. I, yeah, I'm with you. Hey, yeah. you, on that staff, AJ was Steve Clifford, and so yeah. you got to know him uh, for a couple of years here. And I think for Magic fans that you know, it's it's easy to look at the record and you can say, okay, well. But he's he's brought this team back to the playoffs two consecutive uh -huh. years. Why is that? What what is it about Steve Clifford's preparation and his job as a coach that, that makes him a great coach? Yeah, uh, you know when you're a player, you probably spend more time with the assistant coaches. So Bob Byer and Steve Clifford was the guys that I really spend more time around. You know, as a player, outside of you know the conversations of who's ever doing that scout. But with Cliff, you knew that. He was an uh, even-keeled guy, which, which, is, which you need in NBA. You can't get too high or too low. But he's one of those guys that's just, you know, kind – I'm not like an older brother type, 
in a sense of like he's not going to really get on you in a sense that where he belittles you but right. hey you need to think about this you need to think about that and he's always puts you in a mode of thinking the game and just trying to get you to understand what's best for the team and what you need to do to help the team win and he was able to communicate that and he's a good communicator, and he's just one of my favorite assistant coaches. And, you know, you see his demeanor over there on the bench. He doesn't get too riled up. He doesn't get too high, too low. But at the same time, you know, it's about the process and the journey, and he does a good job of communicating to the guys. And, you know, he's just – he was one of my favorites. He was one of my favorite assistant coaches. I think that's great. Magic fans will love that. And, and AJ, so, George, I'm looking at this, right? I'm, I come across an article, the Post and Courier, right? They wrote an article where they ranked the top 10 players all time coming out of the college. Of Believe Charles. it or not, I saw this article. <laughs> did you see I that? Did you see that I same did. one? I did. You, I, clearly, AJ, where is that framed on your house? Where is that article framed <laughs> in your house? Well, number one, whoever wrote the article needs to, you have to start at 10 and work your way well, down. The person would, be my <laughs> only, would, be, would be my only advice. The funny thing is I mean, the person that wrote the article, his name was Schmanthony Schmanson. And I, I, I was, it was interesting that that, that, that writer was Schmanthony Schmanson. That yeah, I thought that was interesting. That I, 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 my my only critique one. would have been to start at 10, but, not, but I have no critique of the rankings. But I Just, thought that was great. Probably no surprise, AJ. But I think, it's a, I think people need to remember – you know, how the success and those great teams that you had at the College of Charleston. And I don't think all of us realize the impact, you know, for them to feel that highly that, you, you know, they have you as the best player to come out of that school. You had the biggest win in that yeah. school's franchise history in the NCAA tournament. But I think that's, uh, that's another feather in your cap uh, and a long line of accomplishments. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, my college career uh, didn't start off so well just because, you know, I, I felt some type of way. It was my first time playing basketball full time. And that was weird to me. Not playing football was weird. Yeah. So it was, my, so my first few months on campus was not good. Like uh, I was homesick, even though I was only 15 minutes away from home. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like it was my, like my mom, I went home every weekend, even though I was only 15 minutes away. My mom would have a birthday cake for me every weekend so it was my first my first college experience the first few months was awful my coach couldn't get were, a birthday cake on my birthday <laughs> <laughs> well mama johnson used to show me a lot of love that maybe she great. knew what was coming down the turnpike so she wanted to take <laughs> care of me but That's uh, exactly right but, uh no nah, she, she took care of me but yeah so it was just one of those things uh that my first few months on campus was kind of rough. My coaches were on me. Classes weren't going so well. And I mean, not just because I just wasn't giving much energy and, and, and effort to it. But, you know, as I started to warm up to college life, I started playing better. And then my senior year, well, before my senior year, I came, I made a trip to Atlanta. Uh, I was good friends with Jane Forrest, who played at Georgia Tech and played against Stephon Marbury, who was the second pick in the draft. And for a whole week, you know, all the Georgia Tech guys, I guess they didn't like guarding Steph. So since they had some new blood there, they're like, hey, you guard Steph. So I was guarding Steph the whole week, every game. They almost got boring. They almost got tiring. But <laughs> for him to be the number two pick, I yeah. felt like I was in his neighborhood. So once I got that reassurance that, hey, the NBA may be a possibility, I went home with a renewed focus. I worked hard and my senior year, I just kicked the doors in and it worked out. So, uh, you know, but one thing I'm, I'm probably, of course, everyone talks about being competitive. Uh, I'm one of the most competitive guys, you know, that, that played down there in Charleston. Uh, I had a great coach and coach Crest that always put me in a position to be successful. And we had a lot of great teams, a lot of great players and, you know, we were ranked in the top 25 at the end of the year, two out of my four years. So we were pretty good. But my coach had us like junkyard dogs. Like we were, we would bite your head off. If, if you, you know, if you mess with one of us or you had a good game, that's where I kind of get that from. Like you got to leave here with your jersey and some blood or something. Our, like our practices were so dirty. Like you would get elbowed. We had a fight every week. 
our practices were so dirty that is that right? Yeah, I love that. Just, was that physical in practice? Yes. So the game, yes. the game was probably kind the, of a break. The game was easy, and right. our coach kind of wanted you to kind of go at each other because it made the games easier. So our practices were like war. We battled each other, and they but but we were very dirty. We were very dirty in practice. So like that. Uh, so you would go up for a shot. Someone would put their foot underneath you. Like it, it was, you would drive wow. and make a pass and look away. Somebody would elbow you in the mouth. Like it was just, it was, it was super competition. And we had 11, 12 guys that could play. So if somebody got hurt, then that was more minutes that would open up. So it wasn't so much hurting somebody because you didn't like them. It was more hurting somebody to get an opportunity. Get so, a so that kind of, that environment and atmosphere kind of, yeah made me the guy that I was and I was able to flourish through it and stay healthy all at the same time. So uh, that's probably a good bit of why I was chosen the best player, just because I was able to come through that environment for five years and, and make it to the NBA. So, yeah. That, that's why AJ was never rattled. That, that <laughs> explains it right come there. On. My gosh. For five years, NBA was cake after. Kicked in. <laughs> last, last thing, last thing. And then we, and then we'll let you go, AJ, but, that big win in the NCAA tournament. We're coming up on March Madness again. And yeah. I hope we're able to get through it because of the COVID situation. But uh, as a 12 seed, beating fifth seed in Maryland, and then losing by four to the team that would win the whole thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. A team with five NBA players, Jason Terry coming off the bench. I mean, that, that was unbelievable what you guys did. And you, you almost had a chance to erase history by wiping out Arizona. But a huge win over Maryland. That must have felt incredible. Yeah, it, it was – the NCAA tournament is something that I wish every basketball player can experience. Uh, you know, kids that are one and done, of course, they have to do what they need to do if they're going to be a top draft pick. But I – that is one thing I would wish upon every basketball player to play in the NCAA tournament. Another thing I would wish is to run out in the playoffs like a finals game with your home crowd. Like that feeling is, is unbelievable. Yeah. But the NCAA tournament, there's no experience like it because, you know, you're young kids. You've been, you know, when you come from a small school, you've been together three, four, five years, and it's kind of us against the world mentality. And that year, our coach had trouble finding schools to play us that would schedule us. So when you get in the NCAA tournament, now those teams can't run from you. And so you're able to play good ball and you're able to bust their butt and talk some trash to them. And, you know, they always talking at big school. If y'all were so, if you were so good, you'd be in ACC and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you just, you know, like you can't really say anything against that, yeah, but you're sure. going to take this L tonight. So forget all that. <laughs> so forget all that. Take this L tonight. But, uh, and the, the, the goal in your Arizona game, we had those guys by 10 with like seven minutes left in the game. And I, you know, I had a bad turnover and I'm still kicking myself to this day that we let that game get away from us. But, uh, you know, with, you know, the, the win against Maryland was great. Uh, the game against Arizona was awesome. But, you know, NCAA, man, at, after those games, I was like, it's time to go get paid to do this thing. Because the energy that you put into yeah. it, you know, there should be some compensation. So, you know, I was, I was upset that my college career was coming to an end. I knew that I would have opportunity to go play in the NBA and, the, you know, to play professional ball. But at the end of it, it was like, man, it's, you know, you're scounging for pizza. You're scounging for food at night. Yeah. It was like, it's time to go get paid to do this thing. So, you know, there was a little bit of joy and excitement in it for me. Well, you did it. You did it well. And we're very excited that we, we got to cross paths somewhere along the way. And we thank you for this time. We're still here with the magic. Is that incredibly lazy or are you proud of us, AJ? <laughs> nah, man. Super proud of you guys, man. Hey, man. The one thing about Orlando is a first class organization. But you know, in those, uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure if you guys are traveling now, but flying back home at two o'clock in the morning and having 60, 70 degree weather, you wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for the world. So as long Amen. as you guys can stay with the magic, man, hats off to you guys and keep it going. Keep it going. No, we're very blessed. We appreciate it. Thanks, my friend. And we look forward to catching up with you here soon, okay? Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And we're getting some golf when I make my way down there. Yes, sir. I like it. As awesome. long as you don't mind playing with two guys that are going to shoot one or three. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Just throw, a little, just throw a little adult beverage in the mix 
Hey, right, hey, yes. yeah, we have a good time. Now you're talking now we're my talking. That's All great. Right. Well, we'll yeah, come yeah. up. We can be. We can be in Atlanta in seven hours. We'll see. You soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Right. Sounds Thanks, good. AJ. Appreciate right. it. This right. podcast has been presented by Kia, official vehicle of the Orlando Magic.